Well, morning, everyone. Good to be here. Nice to see you all. Good to, to get up here and uh, share the word with you again. I always am excited to share God's word with you, albeit sometimes a little nervous standing in front of people. What we're going to talk about this morning is, is, is Psalm uh, chapter 9, uh, a wonderful little psalm. So uh, have your Bibles open. We're going to read from the ESV if you can press on that uh, in, your, in your phone. And uh, we're going to go from there. So as we, as we start, uh, what we might do is just uh, commit our time to God and uh, then we'll get going. So let's pray. Father, thank you, uh, thank you for the opportunity just to come together as a, as a body and, um, and listen to you, uh, listen to your word. And uh, we just pray, Father, you'd speak your word into our hearts. And Father, you might change us and, and uh, uh, that we would be responsive to your spirit as you, as you speak to us. And Father, that you would equip us and um, give us some tools this morning and, and some things that are going to help us in our walk with you so that, Father, we will glorify our, our Father in heaven as we walk each day with you and, and not just walk away and forget the things that you've taught us this morning. So, Father, we commit our time to you and we ask this in, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right. As I want to do, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background as to, to Psalm 9. So, first of all, the author uh, says, says in the title there, the author's David. Uh, so it's attributed to David, may or may not have been David, but it's attributed to David. And it's an acrostic uh, psalm, uh, and I think Brendan talked about that a few weeks ago, didn't you, Brendan? So Psalm 9 is an, an acrostic psalm, so each new line begins with uh, the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, that uh, Psalm 9 has the Hebrew alphabet going through all 20 verses. And then it got the rest of the Hebrew alphabet is in Psalm 10. And so if you put the two Psalms together, you've got the whole Hebrew alphabet in Psalm 9 and 10. And in fact, Psalm 10 is considered to be part of Psalm 9 uh, in the Septuagint. So the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew uh, Old Testament. Uh, and that puts Psalm 9 and 10 together as one psalm. Uh, and, and in fact, most pre-Reformation uh, Christian Bibles put Psalm 9 and 10 together. It actually doesn't separate them into two psalms. They're actually seen as one psalm. So whether they're one psalm or two psalms, it's not really that important, but just a little bit of background. The theme of Psalm, of psalm 9 is, is uh, victory over evil. Uh, seeing and, and, and it's suggested in, 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 that, in the title, the, the uh, Babylonian title, it suggests that it, it, it's a celebration of the victory of, of David over Goliath. And then as you move into to Psalm 10, it become, the tone becomes a tone of lament uh, where God is seemingly afar off and it, it's more of a, a Babylonian view. Uh, the, the Jews in in Babylon and God seeming to be afar off the temples a long way away and they've been, uh, as it were, abandoned by God. And so uh, those two Psalms, when you, put to, when, you, when you look at them together, Psalm 9 talks more about uh, the hope that we have in God and God is close and God is near and he can deliver us. And then as you move into Psalm 10, it's more, even though our experience isn't like that, and God is, is far off, that's still a reality. So the Jews used Psalm 9. Uh, it was used in temple worship. It's still used today uh, in temple, or not in temple worship, but in, in worship. So if you look at verse 4, you'll see in verse 4 that there's, a, there's a, um, a reference to God being on the throne. And... Uh, Verse 4 is recited as one of the Amidah prayers in the Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, I hope I said that right, which is just the Jewish New Year celebration. It's the first Jewish holy high day of the year in the Jewish calendar as, as laid out in the Levit Leviticus 23. 
and, uh, and that occurs in, in the, the northern hemisphere around September and occurred around about the first week of September this year. And this would have been part of, of the Jewish uh, celebration of the new year, Psalm 9. So that's a little bit of background. And now we're going to jump into the passage. Now this time, this time of the year, we, we, you hear the word joy a lot, right? We see joy written here. Uh, we sing about joy uh, in our Christmas carols. And so I just want us to reflect a little bit about that because it's the season to be joyful, right? But what I want us to do is think about well, what, what gives us joy in life? What, what are those things, and particularly this time of year, because there's plenty of joy going around, right? What are those things that give us joy? Is it the gifts that we give or the gifts that we receive, the things that, that we get at, at this time of year? Is it, is it gathering with our family members and enjoying our, our friends and the relationships? Do we get joy from relationships with those around us? Is it, is it Christmas lunch coming together with all the plans that we put in place and everything running smoothly? Does that give us joy? I'm sure a lot of our mums are nodding their heads at that. Or is it finding the perfect gift at a discount and getting the last one? You know, and those plans working out for us. You know, are those are the things that give us joy. Or for those, or for some of us, maybe it's just, it's good that I've got to the end of another year and I'm still enjoying good health. Does that bring us, does that bring us joy? And all these things are good, right? All these things are good. Gifts are good. Relationships are good. Uh, things coming together, they're good. And, and they're blessings that God does give us. And they come from a good God, a giver, someone who likes to, to give us blessings and to, to, um, to bless us in that way. And, and it's appropriate and it's right uh, to acknowledge those things as gifts from God, right? And, and at times we do that, sometimes we don't, but at times we do when we acknowledge God for the joy that he brings into our lives through these things. But let me ask this question, and this is a difficult question I think for us to face, and sorry if I'm a bit of a downer. Why, why when these things turn against us, do we lose our joy? When the plans, Christmas plans don't come together, why do we get upset? When, when, when we have the Christmas lunch and you just can't stand that family member because they're rude and obnoxious and you butt heads. Why do we lose our joy in those moments? When we suffer ill health and we have another downturn of bad health, why do we lose our joy? Why is it that we lose our joy? Well, I think the answer to that is because our joy is in the thing that we've received, right? or the thing that we've lost. And it's not in the one that gave it to us. Because it's the one who gives it to us in whom we are to find our joy, not the thing that we receive. If you, if you use the gift of, if you use the analogy of a gift at Christmas, our joy shouldn't be in in the gift, it should be in the person who has given it to us, acknowledging their love for us and, and the expression of that love in the uh, giving of a gift. So this Christmas as we spend time with our family, enjoying food, uh, enjoying gifts, enjoying the weather, uh, enjoying the cricket, of course. We don't can't forget about that. Let's give thanks to God and, and enjoy those things, but acknowledge him as the one who gives them to us. 
And rather than finding our joy in the thing, find our joy in, in reminding ourselves that it's a God that has given us those things. And it's his goodness and his love for us. And that should be where our joy is, is centred, not on the thing. And that way, when we lose those things, when those things don't go right, when we lose our possessions, when we, lose, we, don't, we, get, we get a pair of socks rather than a PlayStation, when, when the family lunch goes, goes to pot and everyone's arguing, when things don't turn out for us, when we, when we suffer ill health, it, we're not concerned about those things because we know that the giver hasn't changed. The giver, our God, he's still the same. Whether he gives us a gift that in our terms a good or a gift that is hard to bear. Our joy should be in the person rather than the gift that we receive. And this then, right, is how we find consistency in our joy and our walk with God each day. So that when our circumstances change, whether they're, whether they're great or they're not great, our joy doesn't diminish because our joy is in a person and it's not in the thing. And so you can take away all the things and all the good and I can still find joy because my joy is in someone who is wonderful and good and precious and generous to me in good or bad. Now, I'm not saying that that's an easy thing to live out in our lives, right? And it comes through patient application of thanksgiving and it takes time to achieve that in our lives. And we're going to fail and we do fail and I fail and you fail. We fail in that. And when possessions fade and, and relationships break down and things don't go our way and, 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 and we lose our health, we lose our joy at times, right? Because our, our joy has been latched onto the thing rather than him. So how do we find our way back from that place? How do we find our way back when we get pulled down into circumstances and, in, and into the hard things of life? How do we come back to that place of thanksgiving before God? Well, that's what Psalm 9 is about. Psalm 9 is, is, is David bringing us through that and giving us some tools and equipping us to come back to that place of joy that we lose and we give away because of, we've latched on to the gift rather than the giver. So let's jump in and have a look at, at the first couple of verses, if you can bring them up, Mark. First couple of verses start off like this. I hope you can read that. Is that okay to read? I know there's a lot of people at the back. But anyway, you've got it in your hands, in your Bible. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Now, I want to stop on the first verse in the first two words. And what does it say? I will. And look at the first two, words, first two words of each of those four verses or two verses there. I will give thanks. I will recount. I will be glad. And I will sing praises. It's intentional. It's a choice. Your joy is not something that happens to you. Joy is found in a decision that you make, a conscious decision and a con conscious walk into God. It's not something that just comes upon you and is thrust upon you. You have a choice and you have to be intentional to find joy in God. That's the first thing. The second is, I will give thanks. He goes on, I will recount. And then in the next verse he says, I will be glad and exult. And then he says, I will sing praise. And they're the th four things that I want us to explore this morning to help us to reclaim our joy when we get down. So let's jump in. So firstly, when we look at 
at that, that concept of giving thanks. I, I think this is primarily a place of submission. When we give thanks to God, what we are, are doing is we are standing and acknowledging that someone greater than us or has, has bestowed upon us something that we have received. And that is a place of submission. So that place that we've got, we need to bring ourselves into and acknowledging that God has given to us something, whether that be something that is good or whether that is something that is hard. And I say hard rather than bad because God doesn't give us bad things. He gives us hard things. Okay, everything God gives us is good. So we've, regardless of whether things are good or bad, we learn to give thanks via the process that we, we just spoke about. Acknowledging not uh, the, the thing that has been received, the gift or the possession or the relationship or the, the circumstances or our health, it's acknowledging the one behind that who has given, us, given it to us. It's acknowledging him. It's acknowledging God's hand in every circumstance in the good and the hard. Practically, this means intentionally stopping in those moments and giving thanks for, for the difficult things in life. Now, I want us to be very practical this morning. I don't want us just to fill our head with stuff. I, I want God to work in you and in your circumstance this morning. So I'm going to stop now and what I want us to do is to allow God to speak to us and allow him to show you the things in your life right now. I've got them and I'm sure you've got them that God has brought into your life, the hard things. And I want us to bow our heads now and I want us to give thanks to God for that thing. I'm sure they're there. And I'm sure he's going to open your eyes to them and bring them to your mind now. So let's just give thanks quietly to ourselves and then I'll resume. Okay. Sometimes it's a really hard thing to do, isn't it? Say thank you for a difficult thing that God has brought into our lives, but it's a healthy thing to do. In verses 3 to 6, David goes on. Next slide, Mark. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations and you have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very mem memory of them is, has perished. Here, going back to verse 1, this is what uh, David starts to recount what God has done. And this is our starting point in our journey to find joy again. It's in by recounting, by going back in our mind and thinking about the things where, that God has, has delivered us through. And all of us have those things. God has delivered us in many, 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 many circumstances in our lives. Whether we've been through a difficult trial and God has been for, uh, with us in those and he's brought us through it. All of us have those in our lives, right? And David here begins by recounting that. And you'll see that there's a, there's a notable shift from I, I will, I will, I will, I will. And now what is he doing? You, 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 you. And so David has adjusted his focus now as he starts to 
to recount what God has done for him. He's focused not on himself, he's now shifted his focus onto God. And that's an important step for us in finding joy, is to not focus on ourselves, not focus on our circumstances, but to leave our worries, our concerns, our issues behind and start to focus our minds on God and what he has done for us. And you'll note that the recount is not the recount of the, the deliverance that, that God has brought him through is both to himself, he's speaking to himself, isn't he? But he's also talking to God because he's saying, you, 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 Father, you've done this for me. And it's possibly a prayer that David is, is offering to God. And he reminds himself and honours God for the work that God has done for him in his life so far. How do we appropriate this into our lives? Well, we start by focusing when we get into difficult circumstances and when our joy leaves us is, is to start to focus uh, out on God rather than the circumstance. Stop worrying about the circumstance. Stop worrying about the thing and refocus back onto the person. And not only that, start consciously and intentionally, right? I will, I will, I choose to intentionally think and meditate on how God has worked in your life previously. The ways in which God has delivered you in your life previously. God will do that for you. All you need to do is stop. Stop and meditate with God. And he will bring those things into your mind. And apart from that, God has given us... I was going to hold up my Bible. God has given us the Bible, right? It's full of experiences of people just like us where God has delivered them. And God has given them to us to remind us of his faithfulness and his goodness. So let's take a moment and let's allow God to speak to us now and to remind us both of those times where God has delivered us from difficult circumstances and how he's delivered others like David from difficult circumstances. So let's take some quiet meditation just between you and God and let's do that together. As we begin to do this and as we begin to reflect on, on God's deliverance and what God has done for us in our lives, what's the emotional response that you begin to experience? It's in, a, it's in the next passage that David then goes on to. I will be glad and exult. Let's read that together. But, the Lord, but Jehovah sits on the throne forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. Jehovah is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, Jehovah, have not forsaken those who seek you. Here David begins to, be, to find his joy again. He begins to exalt God. And he prays, and you'll note another shift in this psalm, a shift from what God has done and can do for him to who God is 
And now uh, David's focus is not is shifting into onto the person of God and his character, as revealed in in both the story uh, of God in the Bible, but also in the in the story of his own life. Uh, the character of God and, and the way that he has revealed himself to David. And the shift moves again from, uh, there's a shift from you, so he's not talking directly to God, to he, and it becomes a, a retelling of, of the goodness of God or a meditation by David upon the goodness and the character of God. So let's have a look at some of the things that David brings out here uh, because they're important when we're talking about uh, uh, life and the difficulties uh, that we face in life from time to time. Firstly, he says that God is sovereign. He talks about God being on his throne. And, 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 and the, the, the idea of sovereignty is, is that everything, everything, both good and hard, uh, is under God's control. God sits on the throne. And David knew what it meant to be a sovereign, right? He was a king. He knew how to make things happen as a king. He could order people around, take people's lives. He, could, he, he was completely sovereign. And he understood what it be, meant to be sovereign. And God is sovereign over this world. Nothing happens, Jesus said, uh, that is outside God's knowledge and understanding and control. He even cares about the sparrow. And so how much more uh, does he care about us and, and what we're going through and the circumstances we face? And how much more is he in control of those uh, circumstances that we face, whether they're good or they're hard? And he talks about God's justice as well. That God is a just God. You know, when we get into difficult circumstances, when we get into hardship, you know, it's really easy for us to say, you know, why? This, it's not fair. Why, why do I have to suffer under these circumstances? And, and you know, Joe Bloggs doesn't. God, and, and it is us calling into question God's justice, isn't it? But God is a just God. Uh, and everything he does is right. Everything he does is right. And God is never unjust in the way that he treats us. Sometimes it may feel that way, but the truth and the reality is that he is just and he would never meet out injustice upon us. Unlike the people of the world, unlike uh, those around us in this world who meet out injustice on a daily basis. And sometimes we find ourselves suffering at the injustice of others, right? Um, but God delivers justice always in everything he does and he looks after the victims of justice he says that directly here in the psalm that those who suffer injustice he will look after it and god will never forsake us he is constant when the, the things of life fade away when we lose the things the the the, the possessions the money the the houses, the cars, the, the relationships, uh, the circumstances, the health. When those things fade, and life does fade that way, right? He doesn't. He's good. And he will never forsake us through those times and through those difficult circumstances. And he will deliver us in his way, his good way, and in his good timing. And he'll never fail us. He cannot fail us, regardless of, of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. He, he's not failing us. He's not forsaking us because that's not who he is. He is our father. He's enthroned upon the, uh, the throne of heaven. And uh, we need to, I suppose, reflect and allow him to uh, do those things in his time and in his way. So let's pray that together. I'll lead us in that. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to acknowledge that you are a sovereign God. That, Lord, in every way you, you, are, you are in control of the circumstances and the hardships and the, the difficulties that we face every single day. Father, that, 
that you uh, allow these things to happen for, for whatever reason, Father. It's part of your plan, it's part of your good nature, it's part of your love for us. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you that you're a just God, that, Father, even though we uh, at times uh, are receive the injustice of this world, you are just. And, Father, you, the things you bring into our lives come because you love us, not because you're an unjust God. Father, we are so thankful that you can never forsake us that you will never fail us. That, Father, in the difficulty of life, Father, you are always there. You are upholding us and you are carrying us through those circumstances. We give you thanks for that, Father. Amen. So that takes us on to the second half of, of this, this psalm, which, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll read together in a minute. But it starts out, sing praises and the rest of this psalm is 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 uh david singing praise to god so the 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 progression here is has been carefully laid out for us by david when we find ourselves captive to circumstances and difficulties of life which drag us down we need to be intentional in our response the the i will i will i will i choose to we need to recount and meditate on the goodness of God and how he has brought us through things before. We need to exalt in the person and the nature of God and, uh, and his character. And when we, when we come through this, we begin to find joy and hope and that, re that, that um, <coughs> results in praise. And that's where David begins to, to lead us now. But before we read that, I, I can't help but think about um, the, the story of Ga David and Goliath when you, you think about this, um, this psalm. And uh, I think about David sitting on the battlefield, uh, contemplating, you know, what on earth have I got myself into? I, I just said, I'll go and fight Goliath. What the hell am I doing? Am I crazy? And uh, I, can't ima I, I can imagine that, you know, in those circumstances, he, he allowed his mind uh, to return to the times where, where, when, as a shepherd, he'd experienced God deliverance, God's deliverance over and over again while defending the flocks uh, as, a, as a shepherd boy from, you know, lions and, and wolves and those uh, which would uh, destroy the flock. And he would have been terrified as a young boy. Uh, having to fend off wild animals like that. And yet uh, God had used those circumstances and brought those things into his life, those difficult things, not easy things, right? God, why did you bring the lion tonight? I just needed a good night's sleep. But God brought those difficult things in, in his life to prepare him for this stage of his life. And was this the penultimate uh, experience in David's life? It was certainly... A, an amazing experience but it wasn't he took him further the more he he surrendered to God and the more he sat with God and walked with God the further God took him in that relationship and God used those circumstances in David's life uh, to bring him to the place where he he was able as a young shepherd boy to stand before uh, Goliath God had prepared him was God unjust in the way that he prepared him to do that? No. Uh, was David scared? <laughs> I think he would have been terrified, right? Was the situation dangerous? Absolutely it was dangerous. It wasn't safe. But as he reflected on how God had faithfully worked in his life previously he was encouraged and he, that encouragement as he reflected on the goodness of God in his life and God's unfailing character uh, and his sovereignty it, it all begin to make sense to David and although I, I'm sure he was terrified and trembling uh, he believed that God could deliver him through this circumstance and through this facing of, of Goliath and not only did he believe that, that God could do it, he stood up, he took the sling 
and he walked into the battlefield. Now, that's the hardest bit, right? That's the hardest bit is to actually start to move and to do something positive and intentional and, and, um, and walk what God has asked, to do, asked us to do. So what are the giants? Or well, they feel like giants in our lives that we're facing. The obstacles and the, the difficult things that God has brought into our lives. What are they? Those seemingly undefeatable, humongous, difficult obstacles that we don't think we can overcome. The challenge for us is, you know, will we follow David onto the battlefield? Step, step through the, the, the paralysing fear and journey with God. Walk with him through those circumstances because he won't, he won't let you down. He can't. It's not his nature. So as we make this intentional decision to walk th with God through difficult circumstances, then we're released. We're released into this next part of the psalm. And let's read it together because it's, it's uplifting. I will sing praises to Jehovah who sits enthroned on Zion. Tell among the people his deeds, for he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the, of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk into a pit that they have made, into the net they have hid. Their own foot has been caught. Jehovah has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let man not prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are be but men. The response of our faith in God is hope, and that hope rests and settles into confidence, conviction, uh, and assurance. And that releases us from the tyranny of circumstances that, that govern our joy and releases us into worship as we follow God. Jesus modelled this life for us and he provided a life uh, as a, an example of trusting the story of God and walking with God through each moment of, of each day, no matter what the circumstances. And the disciples, the disciples did what disciples do and they mirrored Jesus' life. And as you, you go into Acts, you see... you see how the disciples work that out in their lives into a realisation and, and then an, an appropriation that things of this life are always secondary, always secondary to God. Our time, our money, our possessions, our reputation, all the things that we think matter uh, are, the, are secondary to trusting God and letting him have his way in our lives and when you get to that position you're able to release those things and not be captive to those things singing is just is uh, just uh, one expression of of worship and what we're talking about here is a life of worship it is giving of everything uh, and everything including ourselves willingly uh, in every way, in trusting God, no matter what the cost. So as we close out then this morning, when we, when we experience discouragement because of circumstances and doubts and trials and hardship, uh, this coming week, know this, that, that God gives us 
the tools uh, to walk through those with him. He gives us the Psalms uh, to encourage us and provide us uh, a pathway back to hope in God. And we have a wonderful God, a God who deeply cares for us. Uh, the life struggles that we face, they're not hidden from him. He knows them. They're a gift from him. And what he is patiently doing is waiting. He's waiting for you and me to respond in those hardships with faith and hope in him. And then he's given us the tools. He's given us the stories. He's given us uh, the heroes upon which we can base our faith to walk with him through those circumstances. And he invites us to do that with him. May God bless us as we continue to seek to follow him this week. Amen.